I'd like to start by uh, uh, our land acknowledgement. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We must recognize, like the peoples of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations, that the dish represents a common area of land and the one spoon means that we all have to share this land equally. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of indigenous peoples who have taken care of this land and recognize and deeply appreciate their historic and contemporary connection to this place. While an acknowledgement can be a good start, we encourage all of you to continue to learn about the land that you are on and take action to decolonize. We can start by learning more about the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Wampum Belt Agreement. So once again, welcome to our second lecture in this series. Um, we just have a couple of quick announcements. First of all, this will be the last call out for people to participate on our virtual youth advisory board meeting, which will happen after the next MCYU lecture on November 27th. We're going to have the advisory board meeting between 1 and 2 p.m. We will be uh, hosting this meeting virtually, of course. Uh, this is a great opportunity for young people to engage in directing their own learning and become empowered citizens. We're looking for about 12 individuals who are between nine and 14 years old. Um, if you want more information, you can contact our MCYU coordinator, uh, Jasmine Ng. So let us uh, get rolling today with a very exciting lecture about trees. Dr. Miles Sargent and a group of his students from the McMaster Sustainability Program uh, are here joining us to provide this lecture. His students will introduce themselves a bit later, but let me just give you a couple of lines of introduction for Dr. Sargent. Um, he is an assistant clinical professor at McMaster University and the founding medical director of the Shelter Health Network of Hamilton. He has worked with inner city populations for over 20 years and is also a physician at the Wayside House Inpatient Addiction Program. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Sargent is the president of Trees Hamilton, a local charity which plants trees to improve the environment and human health. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen. Oh, actually, before I do, the most important thing for us is to make sure that you're all aware that uh, MCYU does run on donations. Um, and so if you get a chance, please visit our website and uh, go to the give button up the top right and donate what you can. And this helps us to keep all of our programming free. Thanks, everyone. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Sandy, and thanks for uh, inviting me today. Um, yes, that, that was a bit of a formal introduction. That's sort of my bad for sending that to you and forcing you to read that. But um, I just want to let everyone know that before I was a doctor, it's going to come as a bit of a shock. I was a boy. So with that, let's uh, go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, this is one of the places that I work at, St. Peter's Hospital, and uh, we mainly look after elderly patients, geriatric patients, and uh, I like to show this slide because we do have probably the most beautiful hospital in town, and we, we plant trees and flowers and, and uh, various things uh, in the back area so that patients can enjoy that. Okay, next so, yes, so I, I mentioned that I was a boy uh, because when I was young, I used to play in the woods a lot. Uh, I loved being in the woods, uh, whether I was climbing trees when I was younger or exploring a creek. 
And as I got older, I became a, a long distance runner. And so I, I ran in the woods. And so the next few slides are, are really some of the places that I used to, to run in when I was growing up. Um, this is the, I mean, I'm calling the Dundas Conservation Area, but this is, this is more sort of the Ancaster part of it near Sulphur Springs Road, a little bridge there next. And this is the Royal Botanical Gardens, not far from the uh, Arboretum, another place I used to run next. And so that's a picture of me running when I was younger. And uh, the reason I chose that picture is because that, that's kind of the, the spirit of probably what I look like when I, I ran it. Uh, uh, the point is it was not an intellectual experience for me. I don't think I could have named a single tree I didn't know much about birds. I probably knew what a blue jay was because of the baseball team. It was really just that I loved the experience of being in the woods when I was growing up. And uh, it was obviously private. It was quiet. Um, I think that the, the woods are magnificent. If you stop and look up in the size of some of the trees in some of our woods in Hamilton, whether it's a conservation area or some of the parks or the escarpment, some of the trees are hundreds of years old and they're, they're impressive. But again, it was more that I just enjoyed the feeling of being in the woods. Again, I wasn't thinking too much about why I liked it. Next, this picture was taken by someone who calls themselves suburban tourists. I included that there. This is also the Dundas conservation area, a nice winding path. And yeah, next, that's fine. And yes, I ran in the winter as well. Um, so there I am running in the woods next. Uh, I do wanna make the point that if you don't live near a conservation area or the our Royal Botanical Gardens, there are some great parks in town. This is Gage Park, which is uh, sort of in the east end of town, a beautiful big park, next. And this is McQueston uh, Park on uh, Hamilton Mountain off the link. Uh, this is Sunrise, another big, beautiful park, lots of place to run or bike or play next. Yeah, you can see me playing soccer there. Yeah, I, did, I didn't just do things by myself. Uh, you know, as, as kids, we played outside quite a lot. We played all kinds of different sports. Um, you know, I'm curious to ask the students at some point if you are allowed to play on your school grounds. I'm not actually not even sure if that's allowed at some uh, schools. I hope it is. Um, next. And so it's time for a question. Why do you think trees are important? Oh, uh, yeah. I think trees are important because, like, they give oxygen, and without oxygen, Humans will probably die like, really soon. You know, that's a really good point. Yeah, th th there, are, there was actually, I'm going to just stop and say, there was actually a study that uh, someone did in the, in the United States about eight years ago. It was a really big study. And, and they looked at, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the emerald ash borer. It's a little insect. It's a borer. It means it drills holes in trees and it kills all the ash trees. Unfortunately, we have lots of trees, not just ash trees. And this researcher found that in the states where these trees were dying, that the rates of heart disease and lung disease were going up in the years after all these trees died. And of course, they're thinking it's because of the decrease in oxygen from the death of all those trees. Uh, any other ideas? Go ahead, Sandy. No, I was just going to say, anybody else have... Uh... Any questions? Uh, there's a there's an answer in the chat about trees are important because they create animal habitat. Absolutely. Yes, and in fact, animals need um, what you call corridors. So uh, I do live out in the country, uh, for those who got that question right. And it's important that farmers leave some areas uh, open so that the animals can travel through the forest from one big area of forest to another along these corridors. Any other uh, right. answers? Yep. 
I think we're we're good here, uh, Miles. Okay, great. Yep, next slide. So I just got to get rid of the chat here so I can see the slide. There we are. Okay. Um, so why trees are important? Why should why should a doctor care about trees? So um, there are a lot of benefits of trees for people's physical health. There are benefits for your mental health. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what can we do about having more trees? Next. So that is uh, one of my two boys on a, a zip line a number of years ago. It's a nice place. This is the one, where is it? Long Point Conservation uh, Area that has that zip. That's a really fun experience if you ever have a chance to go down there. Next. So I think about uh, the things that trees do in two ways. Um, so if you were to plant a tree downtown Hamilton, it would have both benefits to the whole world and benefits to the local environment around where it's planted. So the benefits to the whole world, as uh, one of the kids just said, is that it does, uh, trees do absorb carbon dioxide, which you don't want in the air, and they give off oxygen. And of course, that's not just, a, I mean, of course, that's hope happening locally, but we, you know, planting trees worldwide, it obviously has benefits for the entire world. And then locally, trees do a whole bunch of things. Um, I think the, the students are going to talk a bit about this too, but they do decrease noise. Uh, they obviously allow for cooling. Um, and of course, they provide shade. And there's a number of other things they do as well. Next. So trees and physical health. Next. All right. So I have listed some of the conditions which have been shown that trees help with. And so, you know, as young people, uh, these are not problems for you. They might be problems for your parents, your grandparents, things like, um, you know, heart disease, high blood pressure, developing diabetes, lung diseases, skin diseases like skin cancer, uh, obviously heat exposure and there's also evidence as well that trees improve your immune function or your ability to fight off infections. Uh, yeah, and the, the word tamarack there is because that is a picture of one of my tamarack trees in the property, and that's what the bark looks like. Uh, next, this is a Hamilton heat map. I, I found this online a couple of years ago, um, and uh, someone had put this up. It's pretty interesting. It, it shows the green areas are the cool areas and the red dark areas are the hot areas. So it's not surprising that, you know, in the north of our city there where it says steel industry, that's, that's a hot area. There aren't a lot of trees and there's a lot of industry. Um, and downtown, a lot of buildings, a lot of pavement, not a lot of trees. And then you can even see in some areas of Mount Hamilton, some some hot areas there as well. And then in the places where there are more trees, Burlington, Stony Creek Mountain, uh, although there's more and more development on Stony Creek Mountain, so that one's probably getting hotter as well, but you can see that those areas are cool relatively. So why is there a green line uh, along there, a cool line? What is that? Uh, because like there's a forest there and Trees like sometimes prevent like heat getting like too hot and stuff. Yes, exactly. Now, what what is that forest area called in Hamilton? Um, I'm not sure. But you're exactly right. Those are trees along a line there. What is that line? What is the line that separates Mount Hamilton from downtown Hamilton? Got in the uh, chat. He's okay, yeah, thank you for helping with that. When what is the answer? Um, he, he's got creek. It's actually the escarpment. So that's that is the escarpment um, along that line there, because of course you know there are no houses, there is no pavement. It's all trees along the escarpment there. So that's uh, that's pretty neat. And um, so all those areas which are green are areas which would have more trees. And that's, that's the point. You know, I could, you know, if we had time, I could go through every body system and the impact of heat or climate change on various body systems. This is kind of an obvious one. 
if you live in a hotter part of town, if you, you know, if you can't seek shade, then people who are uh, either exercising or need to work outside. I always think about roofers in the summer who are up on a roof. It seems to me it's a crazy hard job. They got to lift all those shingles up a ladder on the roof and it's, it's a, you know, dark roof and it's 35 degrees out really kind of a dangerous job in terms of heat exhaustion or sometimes you hear about, uh, it seems to more in the States of football players with all their equipment on practicing in a hot part of the day and, and, and sometimes guys having heat exhaustion or heat stroke. So difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke is, is actually the temperature that your body gets to heat exhaustion comes before heat stroke. And, you know, people feel, as you can see the symptoms there, you know, dizzy or they're sweating and maybe they feel nauseated, like they're going to throw up, might start getting muscle cramps. And so obviously you're, you know, getting those symptoms, you know, you've got to get to a cool place and drink and get hydrated before you get to the place where you're having heat stroke um, and your temperature is getting up about 103, which is very high. And that's quite a dangerous thing. And people usually end up in hospital with that. Um, so, you know, people just need to be careful in the summer if they're, you know, if it's a hot day that they're staying near the shade and they're drinking a lot. Next. So uh, trees and mental health. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how trees benefit mental health next. So there are all kinds of scientific studies that have been done on the benefits of trees for your mental health or for stress. And I've listed some of them here. So there's something called forest bathing, which is actually a Japanese researcher first sort of came up with this idea of just even going for a walk in the woods for 15 minutes can decrease uh, blood levels of, of sort of these stress hormones. It decreases your anxiety. Some researchers have checked blood pressure of people before they go in the woods and after they come out of the woods and the blood pressure is lower. Um, you know, studies have even shown that, that having a screensaver, which has a nature scene on it, um, is, is beneficial. Um, exercising in a natural environment is, is beneficial for stress, more so than exercising in a gym. And there's a couple other studies here as well. And so it's, it was kind of interesting to me because I sort of joking about being a kid and um, kind of happy go lucky running in the woods and not really knowing why I liked it. And then years later, as a family doctor reading all these studies and realizing why I did like the woods so much that I was getting all these benefits. And again, as a runner in high school and university um, and all the stresses that sometimes you have around exams and, and studying, I, I realize now all the benefits I was getting from, from being in the woods so much. Next. The other place I work, so I work at the hospital St. Peter's. I also work with men who have uh, addictions, and um, some of my my patients who have addictions also have mental health issues, such as post traumatic stress disorder, uh, attention deficit, uh, depression, anxiety, psychotic disorder, and personality disorders such as anger or conduct, and. If you look at the list of conditions which exposure to green environments, forests, the conditions which benefit from it, it's basically the same conditions that my, my patients have. So it was sort of obvious to me that I should get my, my guys out into the woods next. So uh, I, uh, with a couple other people, started a, a tree charity called uh, Trees for Hamilton. That was about 10 years ago. And it sort of allowed uh, some of my, my clients to get more connected with nature. It, we're obviously a tree charity that plants trees. And we do some advocacy to help uh, less trees get cut down in the city. Um, we, we plant in downtown areas to create more shade. And we also do big plantings in the conservation area to hopefully have a bit of an impact on oxygen and, and decreasing CO2. Next. Uh, I think one of the students in the uh, university group knows my kids. Uh, and uh, anyway, so here's a picture. In the early days of a charity, it's, you know, you start small. And so I would, uh, I'd basically force my kids to come out and plant trees. And so on the left is uh, my son is one of those uh, six guys. And we were planting at Churchill Park uh, in Westdale. 
And then on the uh, right is my daughter with one of her friends planting at 50 Point Conservation Area, which is in the very far east end of, of Hamilton. Next. And I also have uh, managed to talk some of my family doctor friends into planting. And this is a planting we did at uh, Dundas Conservation Area a few years ago. Next. Our charity also plants at long-term care facilities. Uh, again, sort of for the benefits of elderly people being able to see the trees. And we plant, uh, mentions at the bottom there, eastern red bud trees uh, and, and other trees which have berries on them, which bring birds for the uh, residents to see next. And so here I am with a few of the counselors, the uh, mental health counselors at the site I work with, and the guys who are covering their faces are some of the uh, clients covering their faces for confidentiality, but uh, we usually plant twice a year with, with those guys. Next. So there is something uh, which is now referred to as climate grief or climate anxiety, and, and that's the fact that you know people do worry about climate change and, and what can we do about it. And psychologists who look at that have found the best thing you can do if you're feeling anxious about the climate is to, is to act, is to, uh, is to take action. Next. Um, obviously, connecting with nature is important. Next. I, I like to make the point, so yes, I do live on a farm and I can plant trees on my farm and not everybody can do that. But you can do greening almost anywhere you live. And this is somebody's balcony. And I think a lot of those things are edibles uh, that they're uh, probably adding to their meals. And some of the things may not be edibles. It's just nice to have some, some green on their balcony next. And I like to imagine that if everybody put, uh, you know, plants on their balcony, this is what an apartment building might look like. And then that is a real apartment building or uh, two complexes. Next. Um, I like this question quote from Greta because I, I couldn't agree with it more. I mean, yes, more research does need to be done, but a lot of research has been done already. We, we know, you know, what needs to be done in society. We do need to sort of change the way we do things. And so I'm a big believer in, in getting out there and, and acting. Next. Uh, this is a website I came across a few years ago, which I really, really like. It's, I mean, it's really quite simple and it lists 101 different ways you can f fight climate change. Yep. Next. And here are, uh, here's how they've broken it down. It was a one, two, three, four, five. So six different things are kind of categories they've broken it into. And each one obviously has about 10 or 15 ideas. I have put a few ideas from each one here. So things you can do inside your house, house like changing to LED lights, uh, programming your thermostat um, on your table. So that's food choices. Um, you know, some people obviously love eating meat, but, you know, maybe you could eat a bit less um, along your route. So that's some transportation ideas, uh, you know, walking or biking, uh, things you can do in your neighborhood, like starting up a tree planting, uh, things you can do in your city and some ideas there and things you can do with the entire community. So I see there that the website is listed, but you could just Google, um, you know, 101 ways to fight climate change. That's going to come up pretty easily for you. And, and uh, you might take a look at that and see if there's things you can do with your parents or your school. Um, and I'd recommend that. So that's the end of my talk. I'm going to pass it over to the students now. Perfect. Uh, okay. So uh, before we go any further, I guess we'll just go around uh, our team and just say our names. Uh, so my name is Asad. Peyton. I'm Arib. Hi, I'm Astara. Massimo. And hi, I'm Allison. And we're going to be giving you a little presentation about uh, what a carbon sink is and uh, our project that we're working on. So can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so who are we? So we are students enrolled in the course Sustain 3 SO3 from McMaster University uh, who come from different fields of study, including business and science. Uh, we took this course because we are passionate about trees and environmental education. Also, because we have experience in gardening, planting trees, and studying the environment at large, we see this project as an opportunity for us to give back to the community and inspire others to do the same. Next slide, please. 
So what is the problem? The issue is that forests are being cut down at a faster rate than they, than they can be replenished. Uh, each year, 15.3 billion trees are cut down for lumbar and land use. A lot of these forests are not replanted, so the total number of trees in the world have been decreasing. This is bad because trees are carbon sinks, which are very valuable for fighting climate change. So now time for a question. What do you think a carbon sink is? Um, I think it's something that uh, absorbs carbon dioxide. Yep, that's exactly what it is. You got it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So just to give like a, a little detailed uh, answer to that as well from our end. Uh, so well, carbon sinks are pretty much reservoirs that are able to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere faster than the uh, faster than they are able to release it. Uh, so the most common type of carbon sinks are trees, but they can also include the soil and the ocean. Uh, carbon sinks work by absorbing carbon and storing it, which is scientifically known as a process called carbon sequestr uh, sequestration. So understanding this, we wanted to create a carbon sink forest near McMaster University. This, is not, this will not only be beneficial to students as they engage in an experiential activity, but will also produce a cleaner and sustainable space for all residents in the area. Now diving more into some of these benefits, let's talk about some of these specific environmental benefits. Some of these might have already been talked about uh, by Miles, but I'll just uh, rephrase them basically. Uh, so to name a few, uh, carbon sinks contribute to clean air in the atmosphere by removing harmful carbon substances. They decrease soil erosion, and that is because trees are able to anchor themselves in the ground, and at the same time, the roots are able to hold the soil together. Uh, this also helps to reduce water pollution because soil is a wonderful filter and if water is able to pass through it before reaching streams, then a lot of harmful substances are removed. Uh, carbon sinks are also able to provide a habitat for many animals and organisms to thrive, which is important for maintaining their population. Along with that, carbon sinks improve ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are essentially benefits that the environment can provide to humans. This includes providing a healthy place to live, giving shade in the hot summer, et cetera. Okay, I'll pass it on to Clayton. Hello, everyone. So I'm also gonna give us some detail on uh, our project itself and what the goal is. So um, a special event that we have planned in the next coming weeks is um, a carbon sink forest and the planting of it. So our group in collaboration with McMaster Academic Sustainability, McMaster Natural Lands and Outdoor Recreation, Trees for Hamilton, and McMaster's Center for Climate Change are planning uh, to do this tree event. Our goal of this project is to actually start creating a carbon sink forest by planting 250 native trees. By doing this, we hope to improve the local ecosystem and inspire other cities and communities to follow our lead in helping our environment. So now we have a nice little uh, video talking about how you can plant a tree. So let me just get that booted up.
So that was our video there. Um, so yeah, we encourage you to, um, we, we want to show some more information on our event. So it's all exactly happening two weeks from now on Saturday, November 6th from 12 to 4 p.m. at 1221 Wilson, East, uh, Wilson Street East in Hamilton. And I think this is a great opportunity to be involved in the regeneration of the environment and contribute to all the human benefits uh, Syed mentioned beforehand. We as a team encourage you to join us if you would like to, and you can scan and you can look at the uh, email here um, and you can contact if you have any questions or have any further, um, if you want to get registered. Um, maybe the link could also be posted in chat uh, or the email. So that way um, people can, can uh, if they have any questions, they can contact that email. Um, and yes, there's also free pizza as well at the event. So maybe that will encourage you to come as well. <laughs> um, Here's another engagement uh, app that we think will be very uh, useful or very interesting for many of you students. Uh, with the social media platforms and networking being so prominent, there is an app who can, uh, that can make this possible and uh, basically encourage uh, knowledge and plant, uh, so you can talk about plant knowledge and animal biodiversity with many other people. Um, so iNaturalist is an app where once you create an account, you can record uh, plant or animal observations and post it. After posting, you can share information with fellow plant enthusiasts and discuss results and learn more about the plants and possibly think about different things that you may not initially considered. So here's the uh, website. So you would just click sign up. You can see already there's 4.6 million people that have already signed up and you can take a picture of something and you can share knowledge on a certain species or organism you may have found out in the wild. All right. And, um, yeah, so some other uh, features that uh, that we talked about here is you can talk about who you are, where you saw it, what you saw, when you saw, and evidence of what you saw. And these are all things that you can include in your post. And to finish up, we also have a Kahoot. So I'm going to start that up right here. Start it here. So our question here is the first one is, what is a carbon sink? So is it reservoirs that absorb more carbon from the atmosphere than they release? Anything that puts carbon into the atmosphere? Anything that sucks oxygen from the air? Or is it a kitchen sink made out of carbon? Yes, you got that correct. Reservoirs that absorb more carbon from the atmosphere than they release. Remember that anything that puts, it, it wouldn't be uh, put in carbon into the atmosphere, but rather take carbon away from the atmosphere. These are the only example of a carbon sink, true or false? That's right, it is false. There are many other ones that uh, Saj uh, mentioned, which are like oceans and um, complete forests, not just trees, so all kinds of plants as well. What are the environmental benefits of a carbon sink? So is it purple trees, clean air, more airplanes, or less water pollution? So yeah, there are actually two correct answers. Uh, clean air and less water pollution are both correct. What are some of the health benefits of a carbon sink? You have good lung health, flexible knees, healthy heart, and reducing stress. You actually have three correct answers. You got it all right. So good lung health, healthy heart, and reducing stress. Unfortunately, it doesn't make your knees more flexible. At least research hasn't found that yet. So another one is, when is our carbon sink forest event? Is it December 25th, December 31st, October 23rd, or November 6th? Is November 6th indeed. October 23rd is actually today, so. <laughs> Any 
And where is the Carbon Sink Forest event taking place? Is it happening in 1221 Wilson Street East Hamilton, Tokyo, Japan, Alabama, USA, or Hamilton General Hospital? You got it, 1221 Wilson Street East. Tokyo, Japan, oh, that'd be quite far away. <laughs> and our last question, will there be free food at the event? True or false? You got it. Great work, everyone. Awesome work, everyone. Great participation. Thanks, everyone, for uh, participating, and congratulations, LG. Uh, and I wanted to uh, thank all of you, as well as Dr. Sargent, for that great uh, presentation. And it um, really aligns well with MCYU's, uh, one of our major themes this year around the environment. So we've now had two talks um, looking at all the things you can do to act on the environment. So uh, act to help improve the environment um, and uh, maintain our future. Um, I wanted to open up the floor for questions. Does anybody have questions for Dr. Sargent or his students? Um, what are some good trees to plant to help the environment? All right, I'll let, I'll let the students take a crack at that first. Come on. <laughs> I guess oak, oak and yep. maple trees maybe. Those might be like, at least those are the ones that I have like in my backyard. Like I got a couple of Japanese maples, so different variations of maple and um, oak trees. I got a couple of those as well. So those would probably be my two, like just because those are to my knowledge. Do, do you know why they're good? Like, so maybe if, if you do, maybe you could talk about why they're better than other trees. The, scientifically, I don't know the exact reason. Um, I guess one reason, at least with oaks or some maples, is maybe because of the size that they get to, like they reach in their growth, as well as kind of like the area that they actually take up. Um, because of that, and that's a little bit larger than, let's say, another species of tree that might be a little bit smaller, uh, maybe that's like it's able to produce a little bit more oxygen and absorb more carbon dioxide. So that might be my reasoning behind it. I was yeah, gonna add good. maybe. Look, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna add maybe uh, spruce trees are really good as well because they're um, they're they're uh, alive like year round, so they're able to absorb more carbon than some other trees, which usually die off in the fall. All right. Well, I I would say, I mean, you're both right. I think all trees are are really helpful. There are trees like poplars and willows, which grow very, very quickly and, and might only live 30 or 40 years. And there's benefits to having trees like that because they do grow so quickly and they absorb a lot of carbon in their early years. Whereas the trees that Massimo was mentioning, maples and oaks grow much slower, but can live, you know, in some cases, hundreds of years, become absolutely massive and so store a ton of carbon. The, the whole reason that this um, uh, carbon sink is being done is because this researcher named Altaf Arain, last name is A-R-A-I-N, you can look him up, he's a world-renowned researcher out of McMaster Climate Change Department. He studies this exact question and his most of his research is done at Turkey Point, which is on uh, Lake Erie. And so he has about six different stations, these towers that measure how much carbon dioxide is being absorbed by different types of forests. So it's too bad he's not on today because he would be give you a, a, an exact answer. And 
so I, I saw one of his lectures and one of his PhD students doing a lecture on this thing. And this one student looked at, you know, about eight different types of forests, whether they were evergreens or deciduous trees, whether they were young trees or old trees. And, and some of the forests did better than others in terms of absorbing carbon. And in short, when a forest gets to be mature, then those trees aren't growing as much. And so they don't absorb as much, right? So I mean, when a maple tree maybe gets to be 60, 80 years old and it's not growing so much, of course, it's not absorbing as much. And so he's sort of looking at how should you manage a forest? Because um, after a certain period of time, and we use wood as humans for our floors and for all sorts of things, you cut a tree down. So what is the best way to manage a forest and allow it to still be a really good carbon sink? So this one student who sort of found, you know, the best type of forest for, for making a carbon sink, it's that type of forest that we're going to be planting um, near McMaster on November the 6th. It's those type of trees. And I can tell you most of them are what you would consider native species. A lot of them are what are called Carolinian species, which, you know, comes from the word Carolina because they're Southern species. So if you want to look up that um, uh, Carolinian trees, so, uh, yes, yeah, so if you are coming out, you're going to see the type of trees that this scientist find, found are the best. And they generally are the, the, the bigger uh, hardwood trees. So Massimo was correct. That's great. Do you have another question? Um, thanks for that answer. Um, I don't have any more questions. Okay, fair enough. Do you want to ask your question? I didn't have a question. It's just from the last question. Okay. In part. So, sorry. It was just raised. Wait a minute. Okay. Well, if you remember it, you can um, you can uh, chime in again. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? So, you know, like how some big trees, some of their roots are above ground. Do they like have a purpose for being above ground or how like, or like, is it just because some, like it ran out of space underneath? All right, let's uh, let the uh, university students take a crack at it. The university students are basically either in grade well, probably 14, 15, or 16, so they should probably have some good answers. <laughs> it's fun putting them on the spot. See, I told you the MCYU kids have tough questions. Yeah, I can, I can answer. <laughs> I mean... From my understanding with, with trees and um, there's lots of room underneath the ground. So ideally they would like to uh, suck up nutrients and water that is um, filtered through the soil. And so if trees become very, very old and there is no room, um, especially I remember even when I was a child and in my elementary school, if there were trees next to um, like their, the hard top or like the concrete, there would usually be roots above the ground because they don't have room underneath because the concrete's there. So ideally, it would like to be underneath the ground because that's where nutrients can be um, sucked up from the tree. But um, if there is no room, then it, it will just grow wherever it can. So it'll go above the ground. And then you, that's where you usually see uh, roots if they're really old or if the trees are really old or if there's something restricting their, their growth. Okay, and I will uh, chime in here. And... So one interesting thing about trees, some trees do have what you call tap roots, which are roots that go sort of straight down. Most trees have roots which go uh, sideways. So when you are planting a tree, as you saw in that video, uh, you, you, you make the hole twice the diameter of the, of the pot, not twice the depth. In fact, you really only make it the same depth as the pot. And the reason you make it twice the diameter so then you have some really soft soil for the roots to grow sideways and start growing sideways because that's eventually where they're going to go. So, you know, over a period of years with all these roots growing out sideways from a tree, 
Uh, some, you know, for the most part, to answer your question, I think the roots do want to be underground, but a lot of them are very superficial. So if you have a bit of erosion, it doesn't take much to expose some of those roots. Uh, in most cases, those big old trees are fine with some of the roots exposed, uh, but uh, that's not usually the intention of most trees to be exposed like that. It's probably a bit of erosion around them. Go ahead. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, do the small trees have the, the same impact as trees that will grow larger than them? Okay, I'm going to let the students take a crack at it again. The, the grade 15 students, please take a crack at that question. Uh, like, like my kind of my kind of like understanding of it, like to answer that question is I feel like no matter if it's like a little tree or a big tree, it's going to have some sort of impact eventually given time. So the smaller tree, although it's smaller, it'll have somewhat of an impact. And once it reaches its desired like height or like estimated like size, growth, age, it may put off one impact. So let's say it's producing like a smaller amount of oxygen, whereas a different species. So let's say like a smaller, like maybe just a normal shrub is going to only grow to a certain size, but it's going to put off a decent amount of you know, oxygen, but once it reaches like its size, it's going to stop, but it's going to keep producing that same amount. Whereas we look at like a big tree, like a spruce, like Saeed was talking about, and that's going to reach like, you know, like let's say 200 years old. So as it ages, it's also going to put off carbon, but it's going to stop too eventually one day in size, but it's still going to keep putting in like carbon. So, or oxygen. So to kind of answer that, I feel like it doesn't matter what you're planting. It is going to have somewhat of an impact just the variation, like the scientific amount of oxygen that gets released is going to differ. That's like yeah, I can add to that as well. That, that's really good. Um, also, the it's important to note that like we're talking about oxygen and carbon, right? And that's like the main, I guess, most obvious goal of planting a tree is. We have to remember there are also many um, animals and insects as well that use that tree as an environment, right? So even if it's a very small tree, think about how small like an ant is or or small insects that use that tree as a habitat. And despite them being, you know, very, very small and the tree being small, it can still provide a nice home for them and provide environmental benefits that way as well. Uh, yes, so I agree with all of the above. Um, the bigger trees do probably absorb more carbon and give off more oxygen, but you need diversity. And so diversity means you know, a range of different things. And uh, in the Hamilton area, there are three different forests that run through Hamilton. So it makes it kind of a special place. The Boreal Forest from the north, the Carolinian Forest from the south, and the Great Lakes Forest. And as a result, there are something like 130, 140 different types of trees and shrubs that are considered native to this area. And so in terms of insects and birds that have been here for hundreds, thousands of years, you know, they like to eat those type of berries and, uh, you know, all of the habitat that is used to having these types of trees. So we can't just plant the big ones for, for carbon. Does that make sense? We have to plant some of the other ones too. Thanks for your answer. Um, Thanks for your question. What's that? Um, me and my dad do uh, tree planting at my school, and um, sometimes we plant smaller trees like shrubs and, yep. um, and dogwoods and stuff like that to, to give berries to birds and uh, other animals. Um, Sandy, do we have uh, any time left or are we pretty much done? No, we can. Um, do you, do you want to share something else? No, you see, I've got my my hand up there. See that? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yes. we have. We have so some I wanted. I just wanted to ask the grade fifteen and sixteen students a question. I just want to ask them as they did this course this fall. What was the most surprising thing or interesting thing they learned? And it could just be a sentence or a couple of words. For me, 
like one of the kind of key things that I learned that I didn't really have the knowledge prior going into the like this specific class with exactly like how many different ways you know like sustainability could be applied and there's so many different things that I didn't consider in like everyday life like from what I thought we we're just going to be talking about all these concepts but here we are actually you know like applying the knowledge so I think it's pretty interesting that not only are you learning about it, but you're actually like doing something about it, even though it's small, like making somewhat of an impact. So it's nice to have like that application component. For me, I would say that I learned that the that advertising is quite an art because um, because I come from a science background and we don't do as much advertising um, within our program. So I like as we were advertising for this event, I learned that it really is an art and there's quite a lot of things that go on in the background. Yeah, for me, um, I'm also in a science program as well. A lot of the courses that I take are mostly just studying for tests, learning knowledge, but just studying for tests. Um, and, and to have a course that I can actually like apply my knowledge and organize an event, that's actually something I've never done before, but work with all these wonderful people in my group. Um, like I really enjoy that so far, and I'm definitely looking forward to the event on November 6th. Yeah, so I have a commerce background, actually. So a lot of the things we talked about today um, are kind of new to me, everything specifically about trees and trees for health. And um, yeah, the size of trees, everything like that, very new. Um, yeah. Um, for me, <clears throat> taking a lot of sustainability courses, I'm doing a minor in it. Something that I've always found really cool is that there's so many different terms for certain processes that I never thought of before, like, for example, carbon sink, I knew about, you know, um, the process of oxygen and um, carbon and everything, but I didn't know that there was a whole kind of concept around it, if that makes sense. Um, and for me, I think, like, the coolest part about taking sustainability courses is the interdisciplinary nature. So we all come from a different um, academic background, whether we're learning about science or commerce or like social sciences. And I think it's really cool to see everyone in the class come together with their different ideas and opinions on issues and see how they all are related to one another. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you've learned and and um, I really thank you for putting forth the, the links that you did on the during your slides, especially uh, the one about 101 ways uh, you can help to um, preserve your environment. I encourage everybody to visit that link and look at all the little things you can do that really add up to managing your environment. I think that's, that's a really valuable piece of information. Um, and just before I thank everyone, um, maybe Miles or any one of the students, is there any other organizations or any other ways that you can think of uh, our MCYU kids can, can volunteer and um, take part in tree plantings or other environmentally positive um, activities? That was for me or for the... For anybody. Anybody. Anybody okay. that knows. Yeah. Um, okay. So what I would say um, uh, that my... Trees for Hamilton group in some ways is not uh, great for this sort of thing because we have you know, so sort of longer term partnerships. For example, we uh, last weekend we planted with a group of medical students and we do that every year. And I mentioned planting with some of my patients. And so it's usually uh, specific groups that we uh, plant with. However, there are uh, a few environmental charities or not-for-profits in town that, that I think do a really good job with getting uh, the whole community involved. So one of them is Environment Hamilton, and they have the Trees Please program. That's easy to remember, Trees Please. Um, so they would advertise their plantings. Another group is the Hamilton naturalist club and they do i mean they do trees they also do pollinators uh, which are important flowers for insects and green venture is another group in town that does a lot of outreach and education for for kids so green venture hamilton naturalist club and environment hamilton i would mention and i'm sure there's others but those come to mind well that's amazing and maybe our uh, young people can go and check those uh those organizations out for ways to volunteer. 
So I want to thank uh, all of you and um, especially you, Miles, for agreeing to come to MCYU and share all your um, wisdom with us. Uh, and uh, I loved your story about uh, when you were a little boy uh, and ran in the woods. That's amazing. So let's all give uh, uh, Dr. Sargent and his team a, a big round of applause. Um, and I want to just ask everyone to stick around because Jasmine has a really big announcement about an activity that we're launching um, starting today and uh, that everyone can take part in. And this is an activity that's going to run for the rest of this year and into next year. So uh, go ahead, Jasmine, maybe you can share that uh, with us. For sure. So while I set up my screen, I put a few links in the chat that I'm going to discuss. So very exciting. This year is MCYU's 10th anniversary, and we're celebrating with two really fun events. So the first one is a video montage, and we want to feature everyone who's a part of the MCYU family. So you can submit a video in the link in the chat and share your favorite memory or what you like about our program. And then the second fun event is a year-long activity. So all these activities will revolve around STEAM topics like our lectures. And then they also encourage you to explore and engage with Hamilton. So you'll learn what all our community partners do. Um, and for each activity you complete, you can earn a custom sticker like the ones on screen. And some of them are limited edition. Um, and when you complete 10 events and get 10 stickers, your name will be entered in a raffle to win a really special prize that will happen next spring. So good luck to everyone. And most importantly, have a ton of fun. I'm really excited. This is the first time we've done that. We've all our partners are involved and uh, it's a great way to um, uh, explore the, the community. Yeah, so for everyone who attended today's lecture, you actually completed one activity. We're, we're going to have a lot of activities, so there won't be a shortage of things for you to do. If you visit our website, we have instructions, uh, as well as all the partners that are participating there. And as I said, it's a great way to explore Hamilton, get to learn about what they do, and get to learn how uh, all of these things affect your lives. Okay, so with all of that, um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sargent and his team again. Uh, so I want to thank everybody, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, seeing all of you in November, okay? Take care, everyone. Okay, thanks for having us all. It was great. And students, I, I'm expecting your essays in by uh, one o'clock this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye now.